Welcome to the Bible study on the life of Jesus Christ, Son of God, according to Mark. I'm so glad you're here today. We're going to be looking at chapter 3, and once again, we'll be going verse by verse, so I hope you have our Bibles. So let's open with prayer. And Father, again, we come before you with grateful hearts. We praise you for your constant care your daily grace in our lives, your guidance, your mercy, compassion, and love. We praise you for your sovereignty, the fact that you're in complete control of all things. That's a great comfort to us. Thank you for your word that's true and dependable. It's living and active. It never grows old. Open our eyes to the truth that you have in store for us and help us to apply it to our lives. Help us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In our lesson today, we see that as Jesus' popularity with the crowds continued to grow, the religious leaders became increasingly hostile towards him. They were jealous of his healing power and his authority and began to look for reasons to accuse him. So in the first section, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Mark says in verses 1 and 2, Another time he went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. So question one, what does God's law say concerning the Sabbath? In Exodus 20, verse 8, it's, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Now the problem was that the religious leaders had added their own rules to God's law until the Sabbath had become a day with over 1,000 man-made rules. They had classified work under 39 headings. According to their rules, healing was considered work. Medical attention could be given only if someone's life was in danger. So question two, what did Jesus say to the man with the shriveled hand? Mark says in verse three, Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Question three, what was the first part of the question he asked the people? Jesus asked, what is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? Now, they wouldn't say it was lawful to do evil, so they would have to say it was lawful to do good. Question four, what was the second part of the question? Jesus asked, to save a life or to kill? Now, they wouldn't say it was lawful to kill, so they would have to say it was lawful to save a life. The reason Jesus asked that question was that he knew they were already plotting to kill him. Question five, what was their response? Jesus was about to do something good on the Sabbath. They couldn't argue with that, so they remained silent. Question six, how did Jesus react to their attitude? Verse five, he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Is anger a sin? No, we should be angry at things that are against God's will. We should be angry over a lack of compassion such as these Pharisees had. We should be angry over the thousands of lives that have been lost through abortion. We should be angry over the distortion of God's word towards homosexuality. We should be angry over the evil and violence we see in the world. And we should do whatever we can to speak out against it and try to stop it. Question seven, how did Jesus show his compassion towards the man? He said, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely 
restored. One of the things that impresses me about this is that Jesus expressed his anger constructively. He was angry and distressed at their stubborn hearts, but in compassion, he healed the man. And that's a good example for us. We can use our anger constructively to heal, not to tear down. This is the fifth miracle that Mark has recorded. Jesus has driven out evil spirits and demons. He healed a leper. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. He healed the paralytic. And now he spoke and the man's hand was healed. That's the power of God's word. And it's an example of Jesus' authority over all things. In verse 6, Mark says, Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. The Pharisees were a Jewish religious group. They followed the Old Testament law, but they also followed their own religious traditions. The Herodians were a Jewish political party that hoped to restore Herod to the throne. So two political parties are mentioned in verse 6. They were bitterly opposed to each other. The Herodians believed in the government of Rome. The Pharisees were against it. But these bitter enemies were united in one thing. They both hated Jesus. They hated him because he exposed them for what they were. You know, it's ironic that the Pharisees were upset over Jesus breaking the man-made laws of healing. But they were breaking God's law by plotting to kill Jesus. We see two different groups, two different groups and reviews of religion in this passage. We see the Pharisees' view. Religion to them was just ritual, following a set of rules. And we see Jesus' view, which was a relationship of love. And we still see these two views today. There are people who look at religion as just ritual, following a set of rules and traditions. And there are people who know that it's a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Someone has said that Christianity isn't being inhibited by a set of rules. It's being inhabited by a ruler. And there is a big difference. In the next section, we see that Jesus' popularity grows. Verse 7, Mark says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. Jesus withdrew because he wanted to avoid a confrontation with the authorities. So he left the synagogue and went to the lake. Question 8, how far-reaching was Jesus' ministry? Mark says in verses 7 through 10, when they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Adamea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told the disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many so that those with, dis with diseases were pushing towards to touch him. If you've ever been in a crowd, you can visualize this situation. People were pushing one another to try to get to Jesus to be healed. And question nine, what did the evil spirits know about Jesus? Mark says in verse 11, Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! As we said, evil spirits know that Jesus is the Son of God. But just knowing about Jesus isn't enough. It's important that we know Jesus Christ personally. Verse 12, Mark says, But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. 
The Jews had been expecting Messiah for centuries, but they were expecting a Messiah who would be a conquering king, someone who would come and free them from Rome's control. Jesus did come as king, but his mission wasn't to free them from Rome's control. Instead, Jesus came to free them from Satan's control. Jesus knew it would take time to teach his disciples to recognize who he was, so he told the demons not to tell who he was. Question 10, did the demons have to obey Jesus? Yes. Jesus has authority over all things, including Satan and his demons. In the next section, we see that Jesus appoints 12 apostles. Verse 13, Mark says, Jesus went into the hills and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12. So question 11, name the 12 apostles Jesus appointed. Well, the first one mentioned was Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. He was the first one to recognize that Jesus was the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah. The faith which Peter expressed was the, the rock on which Jesus would build his church. So Jesus renamed him Peter, which means rock. Peter was the author of the books of 1st and 2nd Peter, and he was the leader of the early church. And then second is James, son of Zebedee, and then his brother, John. John was the author of the book of Acts, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. Jesus <clears throat> gave James and John the name Boed Urges, which means sons of thunder. Then there was Andrew, Peter's brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, who wrote uh, the Gospel of Matthew, and he was also the tax collector, you remember. Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot, who was a member of a political party advocating the overthrow of the Roman government. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. You know, I, I'm just thinking, I, I think I said John was the author of the book of Acts. That's not correct, so forget that. It was a diverse group. There were several fishermen, the tax collector, Matthew, and a member of the political party. So the only reason they got along was because they were close to Jesus. And there was a reason for us in that. There's an example for us. You know, our churches are made up of diverse people, individuals who are different in many ways. But when we're close to Jesus, that is what unites us. Verse 14 says, Jesus designated them apostles. You know, an apostle is a messenger, one who's sent. So Jesus designated them apostles who would be messengers. Question 12, what did he appoint them to do? And Mark says in verses 13 through 15 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Jesus knew that his time on earth was limited, and so he chose men who could be with him, whom he could train, and send out a preach so that they could carry his message to others after he was gone. And Jesus does that today. He chooses disciples today to be with him. We are with him when we read his word and pray. When we read his word, he talks to us. And when we pray, we talk to him. And he wants us to carry his message to others, just as they did. Now, what if the apostles hadn't told others? You and I wouldn't be here today, would we? We wouldn't know the Lord, because Christianity would have died out when they died. The big question is, what if you and I don't tell others? 
the sad truth is that the next generation would know the Lord. For 2,000 years, men and women have been faithful to share the good news. So now it's up to you and me. It's our turn. Now Mark said in verses 20 and 21, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Question 13. Jesus' own family didn't understand his commitment to God's will. They said, he is out of his mind. Have you ever experienced similar criticism? Has anyone ever misunderstood you because of your commitment to God? You know, that is not at all uncommon. Many people have families that don't understand their commitment to God. In the next section, the teachers of the law accuse Jesus and he explains about the unforgivable sin. Question 14. What new charge did the leaders make against Jesus? The teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons he is driving out demons. Now we know Beelzebub is just another name for Satan. It means master of the house. In other words, the house is the body. The teachers of the law claim that Jesus was driving out demons by the power of Satan, the prince of demons. And of course, that wasn't true. He was driving out demons by the power of God. The religious leaders couldn't deny that Jesus was doing miracles, but they refused to believe that the power was from God. If they had, they would have had to accept Jesus as Messiah. Their pride wouldn't let them do that. So in an attempt to destroy his popularity, they accused him of having the power of Satan. So question 15. What question does Jesus ask them? Verse 23. Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? Now, we know that demons are Satan's servants. So Satan wouldn't use his power to drive out his own servants. That wouldn't make sense. What three illustrations does Jesus give? In Mark 3, 24, Jesus said, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And that's true. If Satan drove out his own servants... That would divide his kingdom, and any kingdom divided against itself can't stand. It will fail. Mark 3.25, Jesus said, If a house is divided against itself, that house can't stand. And that's true. That's true of a family. That's a warning to us. We don't want a house divided. Family is all about unity and oneness. That's true of a nation also. A house divided against itself won't stand. You remember that Abraham Lincoln used that verse in speaking of our nation during the war between the states. And then Mark 3, 26. Jesus said if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end will come. So Jesus is a master of reasoning. He makes it crystal clear that he is not driving out demons by Satan's power. Verse 27, Jesus said, In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob the house. So in verse 27, Jesus refers to Satan as the strong man. The house is someone who is controlled by Satan, and the strong man's possessions 
are the demons. Jesus is saying no one can enter Satan's house, in other words, a body that he's controlling, and carry off his demons who have possession unless he ties up Satan first. And Jesus did that. He tied up Satan in the wilderness when he was victorious. He proved that Satan has no power over him. And since Jesus had already tied up Satan, in other words, the strong man, he could carry off his possessions, the demons, by driving them out of the man that they inhabited. You know, it's comforting to know that Satan is a defeated foe. At the cross, Jesus delivered us from the power of Satan. Satan is powerless to overcome us if we resist him. Satan is powerful, but God is infinitely more powerful, and we Christians have God himself living within us. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Then question 16, What sins of man does Jesus tell us will be forgiven? Jesus said, I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. Now we need to be sure that we understand that. Not some sins, not a few sins, not just the worst sins, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. Question 17, list some of the sins you can think of that can be forgiven. Well, lying, stealing, murder, adultery, fear, worry, lack of love, on and on, we could name them all day long. But you remember the apostle Peter lied when he denied Jesus three times. King David committed adultery and murder. Paul persecuted Christians. We have all sinned, but those sins were paid for by the blood of Jesus, which he said for us on the cross. All of our past sins, our present sins, and the sins that we'll commit in the future. But in verse 29, we're told the one sin that can't be forgiven. Question 18, what does Jesus say will never be forgiven? In verse 23, Jesus said, But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. And they said that because they were saying that he had an evil spirit. You know, it's the work of the Holy Spirit to reveal God's truth to us, to convince us of our sins, and make us aware that we're sinners so that we know we need a Savior. But these religious leaders refused to listen to the truth. They had shut their eyes and their ears to it. They refused to acknowledge that they were sinners. So Jesus was warning them that if they continued to do that, they wouldn't be forgiven. And that's true of everyone. If a person rejects the leading of the Holy Spirit, rejects the truth, refuses to acknowledge that he or she is a sinner, and rejects Jesus Christ as Savior, then they won't be forgiven. Sometimes Christians wonder if they have committed the unforgivable sin. But we need to realize that if the Holy Spirit has revealed to you that you're a sinner, and you've confessed your sins and accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, then you will be forgiven. No one who has truly accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord has committed the unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin is not responding to the leading of the Holy Spirit and not accepting Jesus as Savior and Lord. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name among heaven given to them by which we must be saved. So if we reject Jesus, 
we won't be saved. In the last section, Jesus describes his family. Mark says in verse 31 and 32, Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent one, someone to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said, Your mother and brother are outside looking for you. So we can just picture that scene. Jesus is teaching a big crowd. His mother and brothers are concerned about him. They had probably heard that the religious leaders were against him, so they were looking for him. After Jesus was born, his mother Mary and his stepfather Joseph did have children of their own. So question 19, who were Jesus' half-brothers who are mentioned in Mark 3, verses 31 and 32? and Matthew 13, verses 51 and 54 and 55. Matthew 13, verses 54 and 55 says, Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they ask? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? So four of Jesus' half-brothers are mentioned there. James wasn't a believer during Jesus' lifetime. But after Jesus' death and resurrection, he became one of the leaders of the church, and he wrote the book of James. Now, we don't know much about Joseph and Simon, but Judas was also called Jude, and he wrote the book of Jude. In verse 33, who are my mother and brothers, he asked. Question 20, who does Jesus acknowledge as his brother and sister? Mark says in verses 34 and 35, then he looked at those around him and seated in the circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now we know that God's will is for us to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And when we do, we become a member of God's family. First John 1, excuse me, John 1, 12 and 13 says, To all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So we're not children of God when we're born. We're all created by God, but we're not all children of God. God's word says that it's when we receive Jesus that God gives us the right to become children of God. At that moment, we begin become a member of his family. God becomes our father, and every other Christian becomes our brother and sister. Not just those around us, people that we know, but Christians all over the world, of every tribe, language, people, and nation. There's a special bond between Christians because we all love Jesus. We love his word. We want to serve him. We want to do his will. I want to be sure that all those who are listening to this lesson today do belong to the family of God. So I'm going to ask you a question. Are you a child of God? If you're not sure, you can make that decision today. And you can know without a doubt. I don't want anyone to wonder because you can know for sure. When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God becomes your father, Jesus is your brother, and every other Christian who's ever lived becomes your brother and sister in Christ. So let's close in prayer. Father, how fortunate we are to have a loving Heavenly Father. What a privilege it is to be your child and to be a part of your family. 
we do thank you for spelling it out so that we can have the assurance that we will be with you for all eternity. Help us to share this wonderful truth with others so that they can have the opportunity to be a part of your family also. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you.